Saunas is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Saunas and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com as we are getting you set for the week ahead, and it is a juicy week for football. We got college football semifinals and NFL Week 17 all in the dock, and we're going to break it all down, let you know our favorite bets for this week. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Joined here, as always, by Ed Feng. You can find his work over at ThePowerRank.com. Ed, happy holidays how you doing today i'm doing great yeah we got a, a big time week of football with week 17 in the nfl some college football playoff games so uh you know we almost can't not do a show this week right right i mean like we'd all love to have you know a week off however it's kind of hard to do that when we got clemson yeah. versus ohio state and lsu against oklahoma coming up here and i have been excited for the college football playoff every year but i think specifically the Clemson-Ohio State game just stands out to me as being one of the games that's gotten me most excited in the last several years for college football, right. and it projects to be a close game, two amazing defenses, two very good offenses, and I feel like, I don't know if this is just like, you know, recency bias, but I don't remember being this excited about a, a semifinal game in years past, and it's not because I dislike oh. them, I just think this one seems to be extra special, kind of. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's going to be a great game. We'll see that when uh, I tell you what my numbers say. Uh, I think just kind of looking at it, uh, there's pretty some interesting storylines in this one as well. So, yeah, I'm definitely excited about it. Certainly more so, more so than the other semifinal game. Yeah, that one uh, doesn't look quite as tasty. We're going to break both those down here in just a bit. And we'll also go through, as mentioned, a couple of Week 17 NFL games, combining things into one podcast for this week. If you want more covering the spread that we did have a full bowl preview last week, breaking down what Ed's numbers like for this bowl season, a couple of betting tips as well for bowls in general. To find that, just search for covering the spread on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, wherever you get your podcasts, you can find covering covering the spread and while you're there we would appreciate it very much if you would leave a rating and review because those do help us out a ton bowl preview is last week and we'll get back at it uh next week as well talking about uh more nfl games for the first round of the playoffs and you can subscribe and get that right as this post this is the only podcast for this week so just one kind of like thanksgiving week we'll, we'll bang out both college football and the nfl all at once and get back with you next week. Before we take a look at this week's action, though, we got to go back to last week. We had Edward Egras on to talk about uh, week 16 of the NFL. Edward did really well, so we'll go through what Edward had and talk about a couple of bowls that were relevant to Ed's cover in the future last week with interim college coaches in bowl games. Covering the past. All right, as mentioned last week, we had Edward Egros on covering the spread for week 16 of the NFL. Follow Edward on Twitter at EdWithSports. And as mentioned, Edward did pretty well. He had the over on Bills Patriots at 36 and a half points. And that game went over. And I know there was a lot of money at the end of that game coming in on the over. So Edward definitely in line with consensus on that one. Uh, Edward also had the Eagles Cowboys game. He had a couple of bets there. He had the Cowboys minus one and a half. And obviously that one went awry a little bit. The Eagles wound up covering there, but he also had the under on 46 and a half. That one hit pretty easily. So uh, one for one or one for two in the Cowboys Eagles game. In addition to the Patriots Bills game, the other one that Edward had was he wanted to buy up the total for Saints Titans. It was fifty and a half originally. He wanted to buy up to fifty five and a half. So getting some really good juice there, and it wound up at sixty six points. So good juice. That one hit. Uh, awesome hit there by Edward. So three and one so far. But we still have one more bet on the line. Uh, he's at, we're actually going head-to-head. -head. So Edward was awesome last week. I kind of want that hot streak to come to an end because I have the Packers <laughs> plus 5.5. He has the Vikings minus 5.5 in what I think is a fascinating game. I got a little bit of assistance there because the Rams lost on Saturday night, which means the Vikings right. are locked into the playoffs now. 
but it's not necessarily going to mean that they just pack it in because they could still win the NFC North, and obviously you want that that uh, that home game, but it doesn't hurt to have a little bit less motivation on the Viking side. So we'll see how that one goes out tonight, and we'll recap that next week on the podcast as well. Ed, in covering the future last week, you talked about college football coaches, interim coaches, you know, and how they do in bowl games. You were talking about how Bill Connolly had done this study, and you had done a study previously <coughs> that said me. that— I just provided numbers. Yeah. <laughs> Someone, Ross true. Bennett did the study. But you provided the numbers. That's I did. That's an integral part in it, and he would not be able to do the study without your numbers. So, uh, and you mentioned that we should not lower expectations for teams when they have interim coaches. We've seen a couple of games so far, and it seems like your theory is playing out so far. Yeah, I mean, all this stuff is based on small sample size, and we're going to talk yeah. about, you know, absolutely huge sample size of two games. Um, but you saw App State do what they were supposed to do. Uh, kind of got off to a rough start. My numbers had them by, uh, but they ended up winning by 14. Markets were at 17. My numbers had them at 13. So they did what they were supposed to do. Very good team. Uh, excellent defense we saw on that field on Saturday night. Um, and then Florida Atlantic. Uh, yeah. They also had an interim coach with uh, with Lane heading over to Ole Miss. And uh, they pulled off the upset. You know, they were a seven-point dog in that game. SMU's had a brilliant season. We talked about them a bunch this year with, the, you know, how they've mastered the transfer portal. And you never expect much out of a Conference USA team. I never expect that much out of a Conference yeah. USA team in these games, uh, part of part of the schedule adjustments. Um, but they, they got the win outright. So, you know, kudos to them. You know, it's been interesting. Like, they were really good, what, two years ago? Really a little bit of a disappointment last year. And now back to a uh, pretty solid Conference USA team, Conference USA champs. Yeah, that game, I didn't get to see a lot of it. I don't remember what, what I was doing. We were doing something. But I came back, and the game was on, and I saw the score, and I thought it was like an old game because SMU is a seven-point favorite in that game. And I was right. like, this is weird. Uh, why is FAU up by like two scores? And then it just right. kept on going. Yeah. And it was kind of wild how that all played out. Uh, yeah. What did you never say about that one again? I mean, I think I was on FAU side. Let me check. Uh, I mean, I had SMU by two and a half, three. Yeah, two and a half. So uh, definitely worth seven there. Uh, so kudos to your numbers, but that game was honestly just kind of wild. Uh, so. Definitely playing out so far, so keep that in mind in general. You don't need to adjust for interim coaches filling in. And, you know, maybe the, the small sample numbers that, that you and Bill have had of teams getting a slight boost from having an interim coach, maybe that wasn't as, as wild as we thought it was. So uh, definitely playing out well so far. We'll see yep. how that goes. is Because there are a couple ones still in the bucket yep, there are uh, a couple for the rest more. of Bowl Season 2. So yep. uh, be sure to keep that in mind as well. If you want to get in on the action, maybe bet on a couple of the teams with interim coaches, check out the FanDuel Sportsbook and place your first bet today. If you lose, FanDuel will give you a refund of up to $500 in site credit. Visit sportsbook.fanduel.com for more details. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 plus and physically present in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, or Indiana. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Let's take a look now at these college football semifinals in covering the present breakdown, what Ed's numbers are saying there, what I'm thinking with those games, and then take a look at NFL Week 17 as well. Covering the present. All right, let's dive in here to the college football semifinals, starting off with Oklahoma versus LSU. LSU, a 13.5 point favorite here, and the total is 76 over at FanDuel Sportsbook. And Ed, I want to talk about both the spread and the total in this game. Starting off with the total because it is quite high, justifiably so. We know both offenses can definitely be overpowering, and in the defenses are not the strengths of either team. So is that enough to make you like the over here, or is it high enough to compensate for how good these two offenses are? Yeah, I mean, I've kind of been ignoring my numbers on Oklahoma totals all year. <laughs> They've been kind of stratoscopically, stratospherically high. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think 76 is about right. I mean, um, you know, Oklahoma's defense has been a lot better than last year. They're top 20 when yeah. I look at adjusted success rate. Um, LSU's... Defense really took a surge uh, actually towards the end of the year. They had that awful game against Ole Miss where right. they, were, they were terrible in every which way imaginable. Um, but it's been much better since then. Uh, I think they're up in the top 15 now 
when I look at success rate adjusted for who you've played. So, I mean, I don't, I don't, I, I think this market value is pretty fair. Yeah. I'm not excited about either side. Oh, yeah. And I think, go ahead. Well, and we do need, I mean, I, I think this, this means more for the side, but, you know, Oklahoma's offense has really changed over the course of the year. We've talked about this on the show already. Um, and Jalen Hurts has been running the ball a lot more. So Lincoln Riley has said, I think our best chance of moving the ball against Big 12 defenses and some of the better ones is to run Jalen Hurts. So the first eight games, he ran about 13 times a game. And the, these numbers are including sacks. But um, but the uh, last five games has been 23 times a game. And I, you know, and, and his efficiency hasn't been great there. He's a good runner, but like teams are starting to expect this. He wasn't able to do it on defense like Baylor, very strong unit, very physical unit. Um, so I don't think it's the same explosive offense that we kind of saw at the beginning of the year. They're clearly not um, trying to get the ball upfield to their very talented receivers. Um, so that that's another reason why I don't really trust my numbers. Uh, yeah. This is, um, I, I, I think we got to trust the markets on this one. And I think the one thing, too, with the total is if it's going to get to 76 points, you're kind of counting on that game being tight the entire way. I think the other, the other way right. that this total could be a bit fragile is if Oklahoma slows things down. You know, Lincoln Riley is a smart guy, and I think he recognizes that his team is not on par with LSU entering this game. And sure. When that's the situation, you want to increase the variance. You want to slow things down, right. limit the possessions, limit the time that Joe Burrow is facing an improved defense, but still not an elite defense by any means. Right. And I could see them, you know, doing exactly what you said, running with Jalen Hurts and slowing things down. So I think that's one path to this game hitting the under. The other path is if LSU just pulls away right. and they can force Oklahoma out of their game. So I think there are two separate paths to an under here. And... I actually think that that pushes me towards, of all the numbers in this game, I think the under is the one that is most attractive. I understand mm -hmm. why the over is interesting because I agree, neither defense is like great. Like, they're both fine, uh, but I right. don't think either is great. So from a defensive perspective, sure, 76 makes sense, but I think there are two separate paths to this game going under, specifically if Oklahoma slows things down and if LSU pulls that ahead, which could very well happen, because I'm not sure Oklahoma the offense as it's currently constructed is built to play from behind. I know that Baylor game, that first Baylor game, they did play from behind. They did make up a lot of ground quickly, but I think I kind of like the under here. And you kind of alluded to this, Ed, but let's talk about the spread here. 13 and a half points. It's a pretty big number, but Oklahoma has just consistently underperformed on its numbers all year. And their numbers have gotten steadily worse as season has gone along. So what are your thoughts on the spread here at 13 and a half? <laughs> So when I was first thinking about this name, a game, I, I kind of, you know, I mean, my number is six and a half uh, yeah. with LSU. What has it? Uh, that's what my numbers have. I kind of thought the market would come out at like eight or nine. And then, you know, I think it was it was easily to I thought the play was LSU because of these right. this change in, in Oklahoma's offense. But then it started even higher than that. I think it was at 11. And then I was like, eh. And now it's all the way up to almost two touchdowns. Right. And so now it almost has me thinking, oh, well, maybe maybe, maybe the idea is to go the other way on this. Um, again, I mean, I think Lincoln Riley's a smart dude. I think he may slow this down, try to, you know, slow down Joe Burrow, um, keep the number of possessions down in this game in order – and, and you know, if, if the offense can do um, – if the offense can score, like we know Lincoln Riley's offenses can score, that they, they, you know, LSU is going to make it hard to cover almost two touchdowns in this game. So I kind of don't know what to think about this. Uh, yeah. It's been, it, you know, uh, it's one that I think there's a difficulty in using numbers to figure out where this line should be. Right. Um, and that's that's partially be just the changing nature of Oklahoma's offense. And um, I actually just looked. LSU's defense is up to fifth in my adjusted success rate. That was not the case after that Ole no. Miss game. Um, they were awful in that Ole Miss game. So uh, over the last few games, uh, it has really moved up. And um, yeah, it's a pretty. It, you know, LSU is the top ranked team in my numbers uh, in the rankings that I look at to make these predictions. Yeah. Uh, Ohio State and Clemson are not very far behind. And we'll talk about that, you know, when we talk about the next game. But there's a drop-off to Alabama at fourth, and then there's a real drop-off uh, to Oklahoma after that. So yeah. expect LSU to take care of business here, and uh, this magical season for them continues. 
Yeah, I think if I had to pick a side here, I'd go with Oklahoma. Uh, right. Oklahoma plus yeah, 13 and a half. Sense. For the reasons you mentioned. Because I do think I would, if I were Lincoln, or Lincoln Riley, I would slow it down, which would lend itself both towards betting Oklahoma plus 13 and a half and the under at 76 points. And I wouldn't be shocked if that's how things play out. Like, you never want to assume the way a coach is going to play things because that can lead to a right. lot of bad assumptions but i think in this sense in this case it's kind of hard not to think that way if you're lincoln riley so right. i i would prefer to just go with the under personally but if i had to go with a side i think that uh oklahoma plus 13 and a half even if they're not going to win like like 10 10 points like if it's a 10 point game it might not actually be that close of a game but they could still cover despite it not being that close of a game. So I think that's that's where I'd lean, but my, my biggest inclination is with the under here. Any final thoughts for you on this one, Ed, before we move on, move on to the second semifinal? Yeah, maybe, you know, it's interesting to see if Joe Burrow can continue what he's done. I mean, obviously, we have a pretty big 13-game sample. Yeah. He's been great on the Heisman. Uh, obviously, I have questions about Oklahoma's defense. Uh, you know, pretty good unit, top 25 unit. Uh, yeah. They are 21st when I look at adjusted success rate. When I think about this game, when I watch these two teams play, it seems like LSU's offense should have a big advantage. So we'll see if that holds. Yeah, we'll see. Should be a fun game. Uh, but I think this one's more fun from a betting perspective than a real-world perspective, whereas the second semifinal is very exciting in both departments. we got Clemson versus Ohio State. Clemson right now at FanDuel Sportsbook. A two-point favorite. The total here is 63 points. And whereas this, the other game is... Very good offenses against good defense. Very good defenses. This one's elite defenses. We have arguably two of the top defenses in the nation. So how do you see this game playing out? Do you expect a shootout? Or do the defenses help this one skew towards the under here? Yeah, I mean, I see a really close game. I don't necessarily see a shootout. Uh, my numbers have the total at 65 and a half. Pretty close to where the market is. Um Ohio State is a half-point favorite by my numbers, uh, so going against uh, what the markets are saying at this point. Uh, I had Chris Andrews, who runs the South Point Sportsbook on my yeah. show, and he, he said his numbers liked Ohio State as well. He kind of knew that money was going to be coming in on Clemson, um, so so we actually opened with Clemson as a favorite in this game. Um, so I, you know, I would lean towards Ohio State a little bit. Uh, when you look, these are two great teams. Uh, when you look at my adjusted success rate, Ohio State's fifth on offense and, and sixth on defense, just excellent numbers. Clemson is 15th on offense, seventh on defense, and I really don't think they're the 15th. I think they're better than the 15th best offense in the nation uh, when you consider the talent they have, when you consider uh, just the skills of Trevor Lawrence, uh, who's clearly shown that he can he can get it done against the best defenses. So the one thing I will say about this Ohio State team, it was truly impressive how they were able to come out in the second half against both Michigan yeah. and Ohio State. And, uh, excuse me, Michigan and Wisconsin. Yeah. And Michigan and Wisconsin are two very good football teams. Yeah. And they just obliterated them in the second half. I do not know what they're doing. Um, I don't know if it's scheme. And it doesn't really seem like scheme. It seems like they are just playing better football. Right. Um, so, and, you know, to do it against very good football teams in Wisconsin and Michigan is, is one thing. You know, can they do it against Clemson? I don't know. Right. So, so that's what I'm kind of looking to see here. Um, whatever it is Ohio State's doing, uh, can they continue it when the competition takes a significant leap up? And I think the one thing that worries me from an Ohio State perspective is you can't really have hiccups against Clemson. Like Wisconsin's offense isn't going to put up 40 or whatever. They're not going to, you know, bury you if you have a bad half. Whereas Clemson could... And seeing this Ohio State offense at least sputter. I wouldn't say struggle. They've sputtered a bit. I think the Penn State game was a little bit of that, too. Uh, then the Wisconsin game, when they faced good defenses, the offense didn't quite hum as well. Yeah, they did adjust in the second half and get a lot better there. But I think I have some reservations about them against this specific defense, given that this defense knows how to game plan for you know, the best offense in the country because they've been here so many times. I think that a lack of faith, or not a lack of faith, a some, some question marks about the Ohio State offense would push me towards the under. However, 
because this game projects to be so close, I am very hesitant to go with the under because it could be one of those where you see a lot of rapid fire action and right. that pushes me away. So while I have some questions around the Ohio State offense against this specific defense, it's not enough where I can bet the under. And I also don't have a great read on the spread here. So personally, I think I think both these lines are good, and I don't have a great read on how this game's going to play out, which is a testament to how good both these teams are. But yeah. I think that if I have one question mark around this game is it's will Ohio State be able to overcome any sputtering they have against such a good defense? Yeah, for sure. I mean, Clemson's defense is great. Brent, Brent Venables gets it done every single season, no matter who he loses to the NFL. This year is no exception. So, yeah. but I mean, we've seen Ohio State's offense. I mean, Fields has been fantastic. I mean, he's got a, he's got some kind of knee injury. Uh, I don't know what it is, but I mean, he came out of the Michigan game for a play or two. He came back with a brace, uh, threw a ridiculous touchdown pass after that. <clears throat> so, um, there's plenty of explosive players on Ohio State's on uh, for Ohio State on offense. Uh, the interior, Ryan, Ryan Day has said the interior of their line is, is one of the best in the country, and you can't argue with that with, with the bit, way they control the line of scrimmage against Michigan uh, and, and, against Ohio, and against Wisconsin in the second half. So I, I do have faith in the Ohio State's offense uh, to get it done against Clemson. Is it enough faith for you to bet Ohio State? Because you mentioned that your numbers do like yeah. them by a bit, but it's not it's not a huge one. Would you actually go with them, or I mean, is I, it an efficient line for you? Uh, I'm leaning that way. I haven't okay. pulled the trigger on it. Uh, probably look. I mean, Ohio State had a ton of guys hurt, so I want to look at yeah. the injury report before I finally pull the trigger. Chris Andrews did like being on the side of Ohio State uh, okay. in this game, uh, so that that's the bookmaker's perspective. Yeah, and, and one that's been and, and and a bookmaker that's been doing it for a long time. So right. I, I do think Ohio State's the right side with the market at, at Clemson minus two. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. Any final thoughts on this game before we move on to NFL? No, I think it should be a great one. Like you said, yeah. probably one of the more exciting semifinal games. I uh, don't think it's going to be anything like the blowout situation that happened last time these two teams met yeah. in the college football playoff. Uh, don't let that cloud your thinking. And it should be a great game. <laughs> As we saw with Notre Dame earlier this year, those are different teams, and it should not impact the way you view teams in 2019. Let's move on to the Titans at the Texans as we kick off NFL Week 17. And this game is one that does have something on the line in a way for both teams because the Titans, if they win this game, they are automatically in the playoffs. They don't have to worry about anything else uh, as far as how things break elsewhere. Houston could, in theory, get up to be the three seed. And Bill O'Brien said Monday that he is going to play the starters. However, it's obviously a motivation gap here. Uh, the, the spread has shifted. It is now the Titans minus five and a half. It was four and a half. So clearly some money coming in on Tennessee. Total is down to 45 and a half. Ed, is, is the motivation gap in these two teams enough for you to stay away? Uh, side towards the Titans. What are you thinking here? I mean, is it really a motivation gap? I mean, I feel like if this were not a division game, you can make that argument a little bit. But it's a division game, right? And like, yeah. You hate your division rivals, at least I know they do in the NFC East. So <laughs> I, I don't know. Like, is there really a motivation gap here? You know, the, like, you know, these T teams just played a couple weeks ago. Uh, I think if you're Houston, uh, I, I think just, I don't know. I mean, maybe they're banged up. Maybe they're hurt. Maybe maybe they want to rest up a little bit. I just feel, I, I don't, I don't know if I see a mo as much of a motivation gap as you do. I think, uh, yeah. Houston will be there to, to play this divisional game. Um, I guess, I mean, I guess they can send Tennessee home, right? Uh, they could, they would need, they would need other stuff to happen too. I believe Pittsburgh, could, Pittsburgh and Oakland can still get in. Uh, Oakland has oh. like a 12% chance of the playoffs somehow. I don't know how, but it, right. it's, it's a thing. There's, they a, need like, there's a way. Yeah. They need like four different things to happen. And All I right. believe one of those things is, having the Ravens and RG3 beat the Steelers. Um, so, like, okay. it's a it's a weird path, but there's a path to the, to the Raiders getting in. And I think that one thing that makes this very risky, if you want to back the Texans, is that the thing that the Texans have riding on is they can get to the three seed if the Chiefs lose. However, the Chiefs play at 1 o'clock, and the Texans play in the afternoon. Right. They may know by kickoff that they're locked into the four seed, and I think that that does influence things to the point where 
I would ref- I personally would not bet Houston no matter what. The only way that I could go here is potentially going the Titans way. However, I don't want to do that either because Derrick Henry's banged up. And we talk about running backs not mattering. And 95-ish percent of the time, that's accurate. Like, running backs do not move the needle. I think that right. might be different with the Titans because if you look at uh, the Titans with Derrick Henry this year, Ryan Tannehill specifically, when Derrick Henry is on the field, averages 11.01 yards per attempt. That's according to the Quant Edge. It's right. 6.65 when oh, Derrick that's... Henry is off the field. That is right. like four and a half yards per attempt. Right. And there's a lot of noise in that because if Derrick Henry's not on the field, it's not a high leverage situation probably. They're probably not, you know, they made it be ahead by quite a bit. So there are, there are factors that influence that. However, we saw a similar gap last year in the numbers for the Titans when Derrick Henry was on versus off. And right. a running back matters when he influences the ability to throw the football And I think that Derrick Henry, in a way, does that because he's such a threat as a runner. So I don't consider running backs when betting spreads ever, pretty much. But I think with Derrick Henry specifically, we may need to. So when you combine the ambiguity around Derrick Henry's health with the question marks about whether the Texans may go full out here, I view this as being a stay away personally. Um, What about you? Yeah, I think it's a stay away. I mean, no, numbers-wise, uh, I have Houston favored by three, a little bit right. of three. I think they're the better team. They're at home. Obviously, if they're playing everyone, I would expect them. If they're playing everyone and motivated, which is what I think they'll be against the division rival, uh, I'd expect them to win this game. Um, I still have my doubts about Ryan Tannehill. Obviously had a great stretch, but, uh, you know, bet them a couple weeks ago. <clears throat> bet against them a couple weeks ago <clears throat> with the same Houston team. Uh, that worked out. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's a stay away. But like, if if you made me take a side, it, it, it would almost, it would certainly be Houston. If we were to get word for some reason that Joe Webb were starting for the Texans as opposed to AJ McCarron, which is those are the two other quarterbacks in the roster. If Joe Webb were to start, it'd be Texans by fifty. Like, <laughs> I would love to watch Joe Webb play quarterback, like legitimately play quarterback again. It would not actually be Texans by fifty, but like. I just want to see that. So <laughs> AJ McCarron, take a vacation, take a rest, uh, you know, go to Cabo or something, hang out there, <laughs> let Joe Webb start instead of Deshaun Watson, then we can boogie. But I think overall here, this game is the tough one to get a read on. Yeah. I think there are reasons to avoid both sides. Let's move on to the Steelers at the Ravens. We've seen some pretty big movement here throughout the day on Monday when we're recording. Steelers are now one point favorites, and the total here is down to 39 wow. and a half. And I think wow. that's because right. we're expecting to see Robert Griffin the third start this game for the Ravens. Because uh, right. they're locked into the one seed. They cannot move, whereas the Steelers need a win. But the Ravens, you know, it's it's an interesting spot here. So what do you see with this game, Ed, with the Steelers now one point favorites? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what to think. Um, but I am going to tell you about one thing that I've been thinking about. I haven't actually pulled the trigger on this yet. Um, but with Baltimore's really aggressive fourth down strategy, I think it suggests in general, maybe not against Doc Hodges, but in general, it suggests the over. Right. Because they're yeah. going to go sure. for it on fourth and one in their own end zone. And the simple act of going for it, whether they make it or they don't, is going to tend to increase the score. Correct. So, you know, they're 8-7 and on the over for the season. Um, They've clearly been doing these kinds of things all year. I I doubt that changes with RG3 uh, playing quarterback. They're they're going to continue to be aggressive. Um, And this is something that, you know, the numbers can't really – they don't right. really capture your success rate and your yards per play and all that stuff isn't isn't going to capture that. Um, so that's one thing that I have been thinking about. A little, sur- a little surprised that the Steelers are uh, a favorite. Um, it's in Baltimore, right? Yeah. Yeah. So so the Steelers are a favorite with Duck Hodges as their quarterback. I presume yeah. he's playing. Uh, you know, who's been up and down to say the least. Uh, <laughs> uh, that seems a little strange, but. You know, yeah. I mean, Baltimore has their issues on the defensive side of the ball. I don't think their front seven is very good. Uh, and Lamar's not playing. So, but 39 seems pretty low. I don't know. Yeah, it was 41 and a half, and it moved down to 39 and a half. So, clearly, everyone agrees with you that, uh, or that, it, or I, I thought initially, I was like, oh, okay, under, I went under 41 and a half because, right. but it's already moved. At 39 and a half, I'm still tempted by the under there personally because. 
And it's, it's nothing to do with RG3. Uh, RG3, I think, should be fine here. I agree with your aggressiveness claim because in that he came in in garbage time against the Rams, threw a bomb to Miles Boykin. They were up 40 points, and RG3 is chucking nukes down the sideline uh-huh. to Miles Boykin. And Boykin hauled it in. Like, you know, like, they're not going to just crawl into a shell. They're still going to run their offense. So I agree they'll be aggressive. But I, I just don't know how the Steelers move the ball. I agree with your claims about the, the, the Ravens' defense. You know, they weren't great this year. I would be shocked if Jimmy Smith and Marcus Peters played this game. I, I bet that they sit. And that was kind of the turning point for the, Ram, the Ravens' defense this year was getting those two guys back. So if they sit, the defense isn't good. But we just right. saw this Steelers offense face the New York Jets. The New York Jets, <laughs> outside of Jamal Adams, they got Jamal Adams back on Sunday. They're down to, like, their seventh-string cornerbacks, essentially. Like, they've had injuries right. across the board at cornerback, and the Steelers scored 10 points. That's also right. a non-division game. Uh, the Jets were trying. You know, they had their starters out there, and that does matter. The Ravens might not. But I don't know how Duck Hodges moves the football because, you know, right. they benched him for Mason Rudolph. Now, Mason Rudolph can't oh. go. Their backup is Paxton Lynch. Uh, so, like, mm-hmm. it's Devlin Hodges because Mason Rudolph won't play because he injured his shoulder, and Paxton Lynch is the backup. I don't know how they score points. Their highest output from a point perspective in the past seven games is 23 points. So right. even at 39 and a half, you've got some wiggle room here. So. Sure. I would be interested in the Ravens plus one now, uh, now that it's there. I'm also very interested in the under, even though it's 39 and a half points. I'm guessing Mark Andrews will sit. That plays towards the under. Um, I'm not, the Ravens might not do a lot, but I can't see the Steelers offense posting a big number what they've done in recent weeks. So I think I am on the Ravens plus one. I, I was not inclined to do it when they were favored by two and a half. But I think I can do Ravens plus one. Uh, I have some faith in RG3 still. Um, and I think that I want the under on 39 and a half. I, I think that this game actually does provide some value, even though there are a lot of unknowns here. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I, I think, you know, it's so hard to kind of quantify guys not playing. Uh, yeah. Stay away from me. Um, but I, I am going to be thinking about some Baltimore overs uh, as we continue to go through the season especially once we get into the playoffs because they yeah. haven't had their foot on the gas for a full game like six games this year they've been able to just like coast which is just right. nuts so right. we'll see how that goes for sure but uh i'm excited to see rg3 back in the saddle once again let's finish up here with our final game for nfl week 17 that is the premier game of this yep. slate that is the 49ers at the seahawks right now uh the 49ers are three-point favorites the total here is 47 we might get to see marshawn lynch back for this game for the seahawks which i did not expect to say today wow. uh, but the winner of this game gets the nsc west and they could be the one seed so motivation is not a question here. There are a lot of injury questions, but there's no motivation <laughs> question. So we can kind of trust the numbers more here, Ed. What do your numbers yeah. say about this game? Well, you kind of got to factor Seattle's off a of bye week after their performance last week. It's <laughs> <laughs> very uh, true. <laughs> but, but yeah, they, they, they looked pretty terrible last week. Um, I don't think Clowney or Diggs played for the defense, right? Uh, Clowney, Diggs, and Shaquille Griffin all sat. Okay. None of them practiced well, I guess... I think Griffin practiced in limited fashion on Wednesday, but then sat Thursday, Friday. So none of them were really that close to playing either. And and obviously they had no motivation. Like they had no reason to win that game. Correct. Uh, because it wouldn't have it wouldn't have mattered. Correct. So yeah. So numbers wise, it says Seattle should win by about a point and a half at home with the full model. I think that still has a little bit of preseason prior in it. Sure. You just look at this year's data. It says San Francisco by one. So. Okay. So however you break it down numbers-wise, I think that leans towards um, Seattle. I think it's going to be a coin flip game. I think it's going to look very close to what we saw the last time these two teams got together. I mean, we know the stories of these teams. Seattle has Russell Wilson and a terrible defense. Uh, A defense that will be going to be a little bit better when when the three guys we just mentioned are actually playing. Um, San Francisco, the pass defense is great. but what are they going to bring on offense? We've seen good and bad from Jimmy Garoppolo. Overall, their past offense is ninth when I look at adjusted success rate. So he clearly can get it done. Um, so, yeah, I think it plays out like last time. I think this game's going to be won on a last-minute field goal. Uh, I don't really know who's kicking it. I wouldn't be shocked <laughs> if it were either team. But if you're getting three points in Seattle at home, I think that that makes yeah. sense, you know, based on what your numbers are saying. And I think that the injuries here are impactful 
And I think that people, the reason the 49ers are favored by three is because people are focusing on the 49 or the, the Seahawks injuries. You know, they've got no Chris Carson. They've got no CJ Procise. Uh, Dwayne Brown, their left tackle, just had right. surgery. He's not going to play uh, until at least the postseason. Interesting. But yeah. The 49ers have injuries, too. Uh, D. Ford will not be back week 17. Richard Sherman came back last week, and he played. Uh, he was still banged up during that game. But I think one that's kind of gone overlooked is Weston Richburg. We talked with Joe Fortenbaugh about this injury, and right. I, at the time, had a lot of faith in the 49ers' ability to overcome that injury because they had overcome injuries to Mike McGlinchey and Joe Stanley this year. So I thought they'd be fine. But the two games they played without Richburg, it was – that Falcons game that they lost. And then they had the Rams game where Jimmy Garoppolo didn't play that well. And I've been in on Garoppolo for half the year now. You know, I've, I've liked him basically since that first Arizona game. I started to buy in. I liked what I was seeing from him. I thought that he was playing well despite of not having full health around him. But the past two games have been concerning for me. I think that this is the first time I've started to question Garoppolo since, you know, early in the season. And it worries me about backing the 49ers in this game. So we're talking about the Seattle injuries. We're not talking about the 49ers injuries. And I think that's influencing the way this spread lays out right now. Yeah, I mean, I have the most questions about Seattle's defense. I've had them since the beginning of the season, this preseason when we talked about this team. I still have them. I think Clowney's great. uh, And I think Diggs uh, has been good, according to uh, people I know that, that, that watch more more of this team than I do, but still, uh, it makes me a little queasy to, to back them even plus three at yeah. home, even though I might end up doing it. Right, right. And I think that the hesitation makes sense because they have been bad. Like their defense has legitimately been bad, but I think that we're getting enough of enough accountants for that in the number right. where it's kind of like the Packers discussion we had last week where Neither of us have been as high <laughs> on the Packers as the market, but then suddenly right. the market accounts for it. And it's like, oh, okay. I and guess we like the Packers the now. Way. Yeah, it's kind of it weird. It goes back so, the other way. It's crazy. Exactly. So I think that if I had to go somewhere here, I, I would actually lean towards the over at, at 47 points. Um, it's gone down, actually. It was 47 and a half. It's now down to 47. But I think with the injuries on Seattle's defense and the injuries uh, to D4, or injury to D Ford on the 49ers side, I think that I am okay going with the over here at 47. I wouldn't be shocked if it comes down more, so I'm not saying this is one you need to grab now. You could kind of hold off on this one and see where it goes. But I don't mind the over here at 47 points. But I think this game will be fascinating because, like, I want to watch Marshawn Lynch play football again, you know, selfishly. (laughs) Like, that's fascinating to me personally. Uh, But I want to see what Garoppolo does because I haven't had doubts on him for half a year now, and now I do again because of the Richburg injury. So I want to see how this plays out because this will go a long way towards forming my thoughts on the 49ers in the playoffs because Richburg's not coming back. And I think that's a major concern for them. So I think that I want the over here, but the side is is very interesting. Any final thoughts for you on this one, Ed? Uh, No, except that I'm looking forward to watching it. I watched all of the last one. Fantastic game. Eh, it was an exciting game. <laughs> it wasn't fantastic. the most fantastic Yeah, football. that was the game where uh, uh, Tyler Lockett got hurt, and I think Manny got hurt, too, during that game. Yeah. It was just kind of a weird game. Uh, and there were some, really, there were some yeah. really poor throws towards the end of that game. Uh, that was Garoppolo's, right. I would say, worst game this year. Like, he played right. terrible in that game. And that was, like, a week after I had been like, oh, yeah, I think Garoppolo's starting to play better. And he looks like trash. Uh, so I was like, okay, cool. Thanks, Jimmy. Uh, but... There yeah, were a lot. Of, it's interesting. His, his receivers dropped a bunch of balls in that game. And Part, the Manny injury so. is really tough there, and he's he's healthy now. So like, but yeah. I the the Western Richburg injury I think has gone a bit more overlooked than it should. Uh, so should be a lot of fun for that one for sure. All right, we got five games coming up this week that are all really interesting and. You know, I want to see how they play out. So it should be a fun one, especially looking forward to those college football games coming up on Saturday. That is all we have for today because there's no cover in the future for today. Ed, uh, anything going on for you this week, whether it be work or otherwise? Yeah, so uh, I did a series on some bowl previews last year. Some of those are probably still worth listening to, like the one on the interim coach. uh, Did uh, Michigan versus Alabama, two teams that I have, I think, have very interesting stories. Also, 
in my bowl report, you can still get the predictions for the rest of uh, the bowl games, both spreads and totals. Since the games are already started, you can get $10 off that report. So you can go check that out at thepowerrank.net. And then, uh, yeah, just looking forward to uh, to uh, to watching some football this weekend. Yeah? Yeah. Saw the Star Wars movie this past weekend, so that was Oh, really? Fun. Yeah. Uh, what'd you think? You know, I was a little disappointed. Okay. I'm not going to okay. lie. I thought it was kind of a little bit all over the place. And, uh, you know, it wasn't... I don't feel like the last two episodes have been as clean plot-wise as, as, you know, other movies in the series have been. So, yeah. You know, my wife definitely disagrees with me. Um, <laughs> so. Oh, so she but, liked them. Yeah, she liked. She okay. liked. She liked it more. Okay. Than I did. Um, yeah, I I am very easy to please. Is the way that I would say this um, from a from a consumption perspective? Because I saw it. I saw it too. Um, I am. Yeah, it was fun. Like, if you're going to have someone who you need to please, I will volunteer because I am very easy to please uh, from a consumption perspective. So I'm not very picky, which means that I enjoyed it because, like, I don't know any intricacies of, like, the world. I don't know if rules are being broken. I don't know if it's breaking the mold of, like, Star Wars, et cetera. So it's very hard for me to be, like, annoyed, and I wasn't. So um, I actually enjoyed it quite a bit. I thought it was fun. Um, Yeah, visually it was was spectacular. Oh, yeah, visually uh, it was great. Which is what you expect out right. of those things. I just think plot wise it was a little weird, right? Yeah, you know? I think the plot I questioned a bit more in the previous one, sure. but I forgave it because it essentially seemed like it was a setup for the third one. Right. I think a lot of the plot that I wrote off in the second one as being a setup for the third one was no was never revisited, which was kind of weird. Right. Um so it kind of makes me think less of the second one, but I thought third one was just you now it's a fun movie. Yeah, and I think it's interesting that they their initial plan was to have three different directors for these three movies. Yeah. And I think it's really hard to kind of keep plot continuity when you have that issue, right? J.J. Abrams did the first right. one, thought that was the strongest of the trilogy. The second one was Ryan Johnson. Wasn't as excited about that, although I think that was more of a minority opinion. Yeah. And then they had a couple different guys that were going to do this third movie before J.J. Abrams took over. And I just, I think it, it, it kind of like, the it, it just kind of jumped around a little bit in terms yeah. of where's Ray's ancestry is from. And right. Well, so. I think that that's why I was annoyed with the second one in retrospect. So I was like, well, you kind of just made that one even less consequential than it was to begin with. So right. like my forgiveness was like, I felt like I was betrayed because I had <laughs> forgiven them, I guess, a little bit. Um I love Ryan Johnson, so like yeah. I, I want to like the second. He did Knives Out, and Knives Out is yeah. like they're great. It was so good. Um, like the Rotten Tomatoes reviews were phenomenal on that. So I, I think we're gonna go. I think we're gonna go check that out. I would highly recommend it. Um, like I would also highly recommend the new Jumanji film. Okay, so, have you seen so the other the, one? It's the second yeah, so one, right? Well, okay, so there's a bunch of them, but okay. the first one is the one with Dwayne Johnson and Kevin Hart. Yeah. I think it's Jumanji. Enter the Jungle or, or whatever yeah. it is. And I, I we just kind of sat down to watch it as a family. Yeah. Not really. You know, it was just like something to do. Yeah. And we all thought it was one of the most hilarious things that we had ever seen. Yeah. And then I saw the trailers to this next one. I'm like, what is going on? Like, I had, I, had, I was skeptical. I was like, wait, you're changing, like, who's in the characters right. in Shanji? I was very skeptical. But it was hilarious. It was, it was fantastic. They really did a good job. So go see the first one with, with not I, I haven't seen the old one with 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 Robin Williams, but the Dwayne Johnson Kevin Hart ones. You like, said you I, haven't I, seen the original one. What? You haven't seen the original I one. I haven't seen the original one. What? Nope. That was like in your like prime movie watching like era. When did it come out? Like the mid nineties, right? Well, okay. So you gotta understand that growing up as an Asian child, I missed a lot. <laughs> There's a big black hole of pop culture that I'm still kind of. <laughs> slow okay catching up on like Fair i never enough. saw star wars as a kid really wow no, so i've seen every single star wars movie within the last four years okay like with my own children interesting so i didn't know this it was 95 okay. is when the jumanji movie came out yeah no so i've never seen that one it, it scared me a lot so i refused to like rewatch it after i watch it that and willy wonka were the two most terrifying movies i ever watched as a child <laughs> Um, like my aunt bought me a Willy Wonka, like VHS when I was growing up and like, 
I just it taints everything. Like I just I can't. I, that movie's terrifying. Uh, the original one, the Johnny Depp one's way more terrifying. But I was older than when I saw that one. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think I think between Knives Out and like Star Wars and now Jumanji, I think you've got some pretty good selections out there. Yeah, if you're a, a movie going person. So you've got college football, got the NFL, got some good movie selections. Yeah. What else could you want? Uh, I mean, it's a perfect setup for spending time with your family. I mean, that's why I Absolutely. really like. You know, like the act of just going and like the build up, yeah, going out to Star Wars and just doing it with family and we all, you know, we did, we all had our differing opinions on it, but sure. but just the act of doing it was is just a great way to spend the holiday, yeah, um, and that can be whether you have kids or not. So I spent the build up before getting yelled at on Facebook Live about Joe Mixon, so I was <laughs> the build up <laughs> to it was not that fun. I was very annoyed with everyone, um, but once I got in there, it was an enjoyable experience. Maybe I was just like so annoyed by everything else that I was more inclined to enjoy it. Um, right. But yes, yeah, it's a get away. Sure. Do you have any uh, Christmas traditions in the Fang household? I don't know to eat, drink. Good. Yeah, not, I mean, not, nothing, nothing in particular. It's kind of changing uh, okay. as our life changes. So, yep. But yeah, we usually spend it together, and it's great. What about you? Uh, parents' house is always homemade pizza, and I am nice. very much looking forward to that. Should be a, a lot of fun, a lot of on driving Christ- too. On Christmas but. Day? Uh, I'm usually not there Christmas Day because okay. uh, I'm. We kind of move all over the place. But when right. I was growing up, it'd always be Christmas Eve. We would do the the homemade pizza uh okay. and it's just kind of whenever people are home now because like right. my sister and i both live on the east coast my parents are in minnesota so right. it's kind of like whenever people can get home essentially right. is uh, right, right. how it works out we do it in an escape room too which oh, i think cool. is really fun yeah those are those puzzle things right yeah exactly i'm terrible yeah. at them i do not contribute at all but i enjoy <laughs> being there so there's That's value in good. that well, happy holidays to yeah, you, Ed, holidays. and to your entire family. Yep. Appreciate you swinging by here and talking for Absolutely. today. Uh, find all of Ed's work at PowerRank.com, and also find him on Twitter at the PowerRank. Uh, enjoy the football, and we'll talk to you again next week, Ed. Sounds good. Yeah, after uh, New Year. Happy New Year. Absolutely. Thank you. And happy holidays to Calvin Theobald, our video producer as well. Thank you, Cal, for jamming us in here on this Monday and getting everything chopped up for the FanDuel Twitter account as well. Uh, I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Happy holidays, everyone. Tuning in for today. Whatever you may be celebrating, hope it is safe, and I hope you have a lot of fun with your family and enjoy the football as well. We'll talk to you again next week. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network.